Good morning or good afternoon if you're you're on the East Coast. Uh, welcome to the Eclectic Radical. We're having another Saturday special. I'm Chris Richards, the Eclectic Radical. And with me today are Eric London and Joseph Kishore of the World Socialist website. People who have been watching my streams may remember Joseph. He was running for president on the Socialist Equality Party ticket in the 2020 election. Uh, and we're going to talk about Trotsky and Stalin and some of the, the history um, that's divided lots of people on the, the American political left almost from the beginning and how it relates now. And I'm going to let Eric and Joseph introduce themselves while I make sure that, we're, that everybody who wants to see us can see us. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi, Chris. Nice to be here. Thanks for having us. It's really good to have you both. I always, always like the chance to talk to Joseph because the things we agree on, we agree on emphatically, and we can give a good argument every now and then about the things that we don't agree on. That's true. Including on historical issues, which we've talked about in previous uh, discussions. Which, which is one of my favorite topics. There is nothing more important than history and having conversations and working out these disagreements. Because what has worked in the past and what has, and, and the conditions that have changed between then and now are important for planning the present and future, in my opinion. Yeah, well, absolutely. And it gets to the, to the heart of the issue that, you know, we're beginning to discuss, which is the uh, attack by um, uh, leading members of the Democratic Socialists of America on Trotsky, which uh, we've written on the World Socialist website. Uh, Eric wrote an initial statement, uh, which uh, recorded the details of the uh, tweets by uh, leaders of the DSA of ice picks and other really sort of vile and, and sort of filthy uh, memes and uh, supposedly jokes about Trotsky's uh, assassination, but essentially uh, glorifying that uh, act, which was one of the most, perhaps the most politically consequential crime of the assassination of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, we also have an open letter which we've directed to Maria Svart from uh, WSW's International Editorial Board Chairman David North, which she still has not answered, uh, calling on her to repudiate uh, these attacks. But it really gets to you know, why these questions are so critical, uh, the base, basic issues of history. Uh, what is Trotskyism? What is Stalinism? That there was an alternative uh, to Stalinism. You know, one of the sort of lines that one sees among those who are tweeting these things is and justifying them is, oh, you know, this was all 80 years ago. What does it really matter? You know, it's not a big deal. You know, so we're joking about the murder of Leon Trotsky. Oh, it's not really a big deal. In fact, it's a it's a very big deal. Uh, you know, the, the crimes of uh, Stalinism uh, had a, a incredibly uh, disastrous impact on the on the uh, socialist movement. Uh, first of all, in the physical liquidation of between 700,000 and a million uh, people in the Soviet Union, uh, and then the violence directed against the Fourth International, but also in, in discrediting or associating somehow socialism, real socialism, with, with this uh, monstrosity. Uh, in fact, the socialist movement and its historical continuity runs through the opposition uh, to Stalinism, which was uh, led by Trotsky, and then the formation of the Fourth International. Uh, you know, but um, these historical issues, uh, what actually happened in the 20th century are of such monumental importance in orienting a, a revolutionary movement today. And, and that was originally one of the things that, that uh, Trotskyists and DSA had in common on a very short list was a professed opposition to that form of Stalinism. Uh, at least on paper, and their cooperation with the the government security services uh, during the 70s and 80s was greatly 
was greatly justified by their opposition to that kind of Stalinism and expressed as anti-communism. Well, it relates as well, which which hopefully we can get into uh, in the discussion too, the role that groups like the DSA have played within the labor bureaucracy in the United States. I mean, the AFL-CIO and its, its international um, outfits are associated with uh, the Federation for the Development of Free Labor, um, U.S. Aid, the National Endowment for the Democracy. I mean, these are um, organizations which prominent DSA members have been part of and prominent Shackmanites, we can discuss more the, the origins of that term, have been involved in, um, are responsible for massacring socialists across Central America for implementing the Brazilian coup d'etat of 1964, which inaugurated two decades of, of military dictatorship, um, similar uh, operations across the world. Um, but I do think, you know, just to maybe begin somewhat more concretely, uh, what is, who was Leon Trotsky? Why is this something which we take so seriously? Uh, Trotsky was alongside Vladimir Lenin, one of the two leaders of the Russian Revolution of 1917. This was the first time in the history of humanity that the working class had taken power. And they did so in the midst of a brutal world war, which they ended. They were then invaded by over a dozen capitalist countries. They, they successfully fought with Trotsky at the head of the Red Army against the fascistic White Army they defeated them. They they then were isolated in the Soviet Union, and and the bureaucracy, a privileged caste, usurped power with Stalin at its head. And Trotsky dedicated his entire life, the last uh, and what he said the most important years of his life, to the fight to expose the Stalinist bureaucracy, to defend the fight for international socialist revolution and its independence from the parties of capitalism which is the theory of permanent revolution, which is our perspective, the perspective of the Socialist Equality Party today. Something and, I agree with very strongly. Well, the good, and and and, um, and look, I mean, Joe mentioned what the Stalinist great terror was, but in the course of defending its privileged interests against the interests of the Russian and international working class, the Stalinist bureaucracy engaged in a political genocide in which, as Joe said, up to a million people were exterminated. This is what the DSA thinks is hilarious, very funny, worthy of making memes. I mean, if you think about what the political implications of this are, Trotsky's children were killed by the Stalinists. Yes. The leadership of the Fourth International was killed. Young socialist leaders like Erwin Wolf and Rudolf Clement were murdered by Stalinist assassins outside of the Soviet Union. It wasn't just Trotskyists who were killed. It was anybody who was critical of the Stalinist bureaucracy. It was artists, poets, musicians, uh, the most brilliant minds of an entire generation who had been thrust into the forefront of history by the October Revolution. And the Democratic Socialists of America and it's, I think, particularly important to note, these, the people who are posting these memes, and they're still doing it today, by the way, the DSA leadership is not interested in getting its own forces in order. But maybe they can't. Maybe that's part of their problem. But these are people who are um, leaders of the DSA, members of its political committee, members of the YDSA's National Coordinating Committee, branch secretaries, members of its international committee, leaders of youth chapters at college campuses. This is not uh, a few wild people out in the boondocks posting a couple of stupid jokes. This is a coordinated campaign by the leadership. And, and if you'll allow me just very briefly to um, make the following point. Some of the people who are, in fact, most of the people who are doing this are um, actually active in the Democratic Party itself. So if I could just give a few examples and then I'll turn it back over to you, Chris. But um, Nikon Fayazi is one of the DS YDSA National Coordinating Committee members. 
they are a legislative intern for a Democratic Party politician in, in California, or recently were. Uh, Dari Resvani, DSA Los so, Angeles member. This is, this is funny, because I know Dari. Yeah. And I was speaking with Dari, and I had to actually tell him, you know, if you don't want to get drawn into some of this stuff, just don't like anything Alex Lawson tweets. Well, she's another interesting, you know, AFL CIO person. But just a well, few she's, more. she's she's fascinating. I'll just leave it at that. But what's some of these people on the list, in addition to what you're talking about, are horrible trolls who go after everyone who disagrees in even the smallest bit with what's coming from the national DSA organization without any sort of mercy or, or basic humanity and say some of the most horrific and false things, even beyond the, the, the Trotsky cartoon. And that's why I said to Derry, you know, there's stuff going on here that you will get drawn into if you like if you like almost anything that she tweets. Well, whatever. We're not really concerned, you know, with these nobodies. But no, a, I understand. A, a couple I more points to point that out because yeah. it's it's a it's an interesting story, and I know Alex is on the list too. Well, just a couple more examples, and then I'll turn it back over. But one DSA leader in New York City, Honda Wang, yep, was another. actually a political consultant for a firm that represents the Clintons that represents yes. Ukrainian oligarchs, that yeah. represents Israeli prime ministers, Tony and is, Blair. And is personally part and has personally participated in the kind of trolling that I was just talking about. So this is the Democratic Party. That's my point. This is yeah. coming from the Democratic Party. It's an attack on Trotsky because they view the growing influence of genuine interest in socialism, even within the DSA. And we can talk also about the origins and why they became so hysterical. But the point is, is that they're trying to create a culture in which Trotskyism and Trotsky, for all he represents and his struggle, the struggle of our movement against the degeneration of the Soviet Union and the fight for socialism today, that's what the Democratic Party can't, can't abide by. And the DSA is the Democratic Party. There's nothing, there's nothing more to it. That's just what they are. Yeah, they're the, they're the, the sort of, muzzled internal opposition that, that serves to, to damp down any more serious opposition. Um, they're the acceptable opposition. Right. Uh, you know, I think it's also worth noting that, um, you know, the campaign specifically against Trotsky uh, has a broader provenance. Uh, there's a series of biographies that have been written over the past a uh, couple decades, uh, including one by Robert Service, best decade really, um, uh, one by Robert Service, a far, sort of right-wing establishment uh, historian and politician. Uh, he made a statement when uh, he was talking about his biography, which is a scurrilous and you know historically falsified, I mean, full of just basic errors and falsifications. Uh, he made a statement that uh, if something on the order, if the ice pick didn't finish Trotsky off, he hoped his biography would, uh, that that would finally do uh, put an end uh, to Trotsky. Uh, and, you know, this is the service is speaking on behalf of the ruling class mm -hmm. you know, under conditions in which, you know, there's a growing political radicalization of young people, of workers, uh, a turn to the left, growing interest in socialism, which all the polls show. Uh, and under those conditions, a, a fear that, uh, you know, this political radicalization will connect with the, ge the genuine uh, history of revolutionary socialist politics, which is, which is Trotskyism. Uh, and, you know, that is uh, for them. And that goes then back to the Russian Revolution itself and that the whole tradition uh, of revolutionary Marxism, uh, which the Trotskyist movement is the uh, contemporary uh, political expression. Uh, there is that fear. And so when, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of types, you know, the trolling types on Twitter and everything, you know, completely unserious types who sort of get drawn into this, but and a sort of middle class layer, you know, uh, who view history with contempt, who know really nothing uh, about the history of the socialist movement, about principled politics. Uh, they're drawn into it. Uh, but it is, as Eric was saying, something which is, uh, th there's a, 
it's driven from the top. There is a sort of coordinated, calculated political uh, uh, interests that are and social interests that are. I behind. know that. I know that the the rank and file and DSA have voice complaints. I know that Eric what uh, had a piece, a thread rather on Twitter where most of his sources were people in, were rank and file DSA members who were not happy with some of what the national organization was doing. And, and I, I think that would be very positive if there are members of the DSA who are really serious, you know, that even if they don't agree with everything that we uh, say, the World Socialist website and Socialist Equality Party, if they're, you know, if, if there's anyone who has really any sort of uh, genuine uh, commitment to uh, socialism, uh, you have to act with revulsion, respond with revulsion to this uh, this this type of uh, you know filthy Stalinist uh, propaganda. Uh, and you know we would encourage members of the DSA who are, are opposed this to raise it within the DSA and to fight to to have it you know to, to, that this oh. should be discussed. There's an upcoming convention. There should be resolutions which are presented which uh, denounce this which repudiate it, uh, you know, any left-wing organization cannot tolerate within its miss, midst uh, such uh, uh, conceptions and such open calls, not only the glorification of the violence against Trotsky, but the, the implication, and it's not a very, or it's not really an implication, it's a, it's a direct statement of violence against the Trotskyist movement today. And, and even beyond that, in a broader and more general and if people will forgive me for being over dramatic, more sinister sense, it's a statement about the suppression of any sort of deviation or opposition within an organization. Because why, why were people suppressed? Because they opposed Stalin wanting to take everything over and concentrate power in fewer and fewer hands and committing the kinds of atrocities that he committed. And it's important to remember that when you're make it's not it's a it's a specific threat but it's also a general threat against any opposition to the powers that be. Yeah, well, it's one that comes from a, a real defensiveness on their part. You know, it doesn't come from a position of strength. Uh, you know, what what I always like is on social media, the uh, defenders of the DSA, they always say, oh, the Trotskyists, the Socialist Equality Party, they're just a tiny organization which has no influence. And then at the same time, they say they're at every picket line, they're talking to workers in every strike and every struggle. Uh, and in fact, they don't even know the half of it. But the point is, is that they're responding to a number of concrete issues. Mm -hmm. Number one, the they're responding to the fact that we wrote an article opposed, denouncing Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for um, using identity politics to uh, essentially say that any criticism of the Biden administration, Joe Biden, the president of, U of the United States, the-, hey, the hey, hey, let's, let's be honest, a man who, by his lack of opposition to it, is a supporter of fascist and genocidal oppression by ethno-nationalists in Israel, who is a supporter of fascist and anti-indigenous oppression of opposition to Ivan Duque in Colombia. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody who is, I know you guys don't think of them socialists, and I never know what exactly what I think of them, because, you know, sometimes with international news, it's hard to tell which sources uh, to follow, but the way that the, the, the tone on Maduro or Ortega, whether you support them or not, the tone on Cuba, whether you think it's a real socialist country or not, it's very much exactly the same as the Republicans, number one, and it's very right wing where they are opposing any, any opposition from even the notional left to the established order. And when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says, I think he's exceeded our expectations, or I would give him an A, that discredits her. Let's, let's be frank. 
even if you still like her and even if you still support her and you think she's just wrong, you should be critical because it's so obviously wrong. And if you do think that it's not just someone being wrong, then it's that much more important to be critical. Well, here's, here's why the dynamic of the attacks on Trotsky and the celebration of the assassination of Trotsky are so important. Because the dynamic is the World Socialist website criticized Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez from the left for defending Joe Biden. In response, the DSA leadership launched a coordinated campaign to joke about the assassination of Trotsky and to praise Stalin. It was a direct response to the response which we got for our article, which was read over 100,000 times, and which we were exchanging messages with uh, a very, very high number of DSA members all over the country. Um, and, and also maybe one issue which we can talk about more too is uh, the defeat of the AFL-CIO's um, unionization drive at Bessemer, where this right-wing bureaucracy, the RWDSU, with the support of the DSA and every other organization, um, couldn't even win support from 15% of the workforce at this massive uh, Amazon facility. So point being, they're coming, they're attacking us from an extremely defensive standpoint. Um, and the events that took place in Brookwood, Alabama uh, at the end of May are, are further evidence of this, the assault. I'll, I'll, that, I'll put it in an even larger context. I would say that DSA has been in a defensive position since Joe Biden became the Democratic Party nominee, which was almost inevitable. I say almost because almost anything can happen and opportunists win sometimes. But it was almost inevitable that Joe Biden was going to be the Democratic Party nominee. And yet when he became the Democratic Party nominee, DSA immediately went into a defensive crouch against anybody to their left, while at the same time, while, they, while the organization itself did not endorse Biden, prominent members of the organization were very active in criticizing people for not supporting Biden, for advocating alternative candidates to Biden, uh, Mentioning that Howie Hawkins existed, I mean, I, uh, if you th the Democratic Party's hostility to the Green Party for the level of threat that the Green Party actually represents to the Democratic Party is ridiculously out of proportion. And anything genuinely left of that is considered impossible. The same people lie about SEP's positions. Well, they're for right to work and they're anti-union. They, they, they don't believe in strikes. And it's, no, they don't believe in selling out for something that, in theory, you should have been able to get without a strike anyway. I mean, it's really a very, it's usually very paltry. And... Yeah. They don't, and, and the one thing that I agree on very strongly in the, the article that, that Jerry White wrote about the, the, some of the, the steel workers and, other, and, and mine worker strikes around the U.S. and Canada, why are, these, why are these strikes all not coordinated in solidarity with each other? Why is there not a national strike in their support at other facilities by the same union in the same country isn't what that whole national union is in theory for yeah well that's uh, you know but of course it's they do the opposite they isolate i think um in that sense the lessons at bessemer are very important i mean because it, the vote at bessemer which eric referred to was uh, i mean it had the support of biden Biden made an a, explicit statement, essentially calling on Amazon workers to uh, vote in the RWDSU. There was a whole campaign in the media. Marco Rubio, the fascistic senator from Florida, declared he was in favor of it. 
uh, and the the union, you know, as well, it was in the you know it was a whole campaign, and they ended up getting 13 percent of the workers uh, to uh, support the RWDSU coming in. There was a there was a massive a massive rush of support for unionization in Bessemer in my Twitter circles by people who I don't know how closely they were following what was actually going on. Um, I was following reasonably good coverage of what was happening from from Kim Kelly, um, though it had a, a a very much pro pro vote yes slant to it, and she was definitely in favor of that unionization drive herself. But her and I think that what what emerged in the vote was the fact that the union really had no contact with workers at the plant. I mean, they, there was yeah. not. And it reflects varying degrees of opposition, but it certainly expresses the fact that these organizations do not really have a base in the working class. If you look at what happened at the Warrior Met strike, which began in early April, uh, towards the um, maybe a few weeks in, there was and, a vote. And which I'm willing to bet a lot of people outside of Alabama didn't know what was going on. No, actually, I was speaking to some Volvo workers uh, who are engaged in their own struggle in Virginia, not too far away, and they didn't know about it. And of course, it's because it's not covered in the media. Uh, it's, the AFL-CIO is certainly saying nothing about it. The head of the AFL-CIO is Richard Trumka, who was president of the UMWA for a couple of decades. Uh, and, but what actually happened in this strike uh, they went out on April 1st. There was then a vote in early April on a contract that was brought back by the UMWA, uh, which didn't meet any of the demands. It was voted down by the workers, 1,001 to 65 or something like that, 40, 1,001, 1,006 to 45. The contract was defeated by the workers, which gives a uh, indication of the level of support well, uh, or lack thereof among well, the workers for this it, organization. What it shows but, more than anything else is a lack of engagement. It's like you said, there was clearly no attempt by anyone to talk to actual workers at the plant on a level that that appealed well, but I think in this case, it reflects them. opposition. I mean, then there was workers mm -hmm. burning the contract. Uh, the president of the UMWA, Cecil Roberts, was being denounced as a sellout. I mean, you know, this is the conditions in which, and then what has happened since, since they've, they've, they've been isolated on the picket lines, there's been no attempt to mobilize broader support. As I said, Trumka, who with Cecil Roberts, was, they were both jointly in control of the UMWA throughout the 80s and 90s as it was selling out, isolating one strike after uh, the next. Trumka has done nothing, of course, to even inform workers that this strike is happening, let alone mobilize uh, broader support. But this is something which has been done again and again. The I'm unions gonna, work not to unite workers, but actually to, to separate, to divide, to isolate, I'm to gonna, prevent a common uh, offensive against the corporations. I'm going to pull up a comment from the chat here, because this is a little bit behind where we are, but it's very much on topic. My apolitical 20-year-old son, this is about the, the Amazon union uh, efforts, former yeah. Amazon worker, would walk by and drop extremely clear analysis on the Amazon unions and strikes without listening to one podcast. He said, nobody must be talking to workers. And they weren't, they didn't have contact. I mean, it had far more support within the DSA and these groups than it did among the Amazon workers. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, one, one, if we take a broader, because yes, Bessemer, Warrior Met, Sudbury, Ontario, all of these issues are related. In the last year plus, over 3 million people have died of COVID worldwide, yeah. and almost now 700,000 in the United States, more than every war the U.S. fought in the 20th century combined. Now, the trade unions, and this is not just in the United States, but in every country around the world, have played an absolutely essential role for the corporations in forcing workers to work in the middle of the pandemic. They have, there have been hundreds of thousands of workers who have died as a result of those policies. We just wrote an article on the World Socialist website about Indian auto workers who are dropping like flies in the auto plants outside of Chennai. I'm... And, and these, these workers are telling 
the World Socialist website that the so-called trade unions, which, rep which represent them, have been forcing them to work. This is under conditions where the billionaires have made trillions and trillions of dollars profiting off of death in the midst of this pandemic. And, and also, I'm, going, I'm glad you mentioned India and I'm glad you mentioned billionaires. Uh, a friend of this show uh, and a fellow anarchist, Brooke Binkowski, who is the, the managing editor of truthorfiction.com, uh, has been trying to make people aware for a while of Malthusianism and uh, a sort of political cult around passive eugenics uh, in the American political establishment, establishment centered around a wonderful fellow named John Tanton. Now, basically the idea is if a pandemic happens, let people die because that will that will make the working class easier to manage, that will create conditions that make the working class more desperate for their paychecks and more desperate to keep coming into work and not to lose their jobs. They'll be desperate to feel normal in all sorts of ways that will cause more death. And it's a very selfish management of the surplus workforce, especially in countries where where there are a lot of people who might start to be complaining, like India, which, yeah, are, social media. which are coincidentally the countries that billionaires always blame for overpopulation. It's India and Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America that Bill Gates or uh, Bill Gates or uh, Warren Buffett talks about when they talk about overpopulation. When Democratic reaction, when Democratic Party reactionary Larry Summers says that Africa is overpopulated and underpolluted, that's what he's talking about, and he's part of the Democratic political establishment, not the Republican political establishment that most of these Tantonites are part of. So there's this interest between actual fascists within the Republican Party and these corporate ghouls who give money to the Democratic Party that converges perfectly when it comes to this pandemic. And it's not, I don't think it's alarmist to say that there was a deliberate decision made to let large numbers of people die. Absolutely. And more importantly, there was a deliberate decision made to make things worse in places like Brazil and India and Sub-Saharan Africa. Also our, also our so-called enemies like Iran. Um, Israel has used this very conveniently to deny vaccinations to large numbers of people in, in Gaza. Well, there was also, of course, a lot of discussion over the past couple of decades over the soaring cost of health care for the elderly. And yes. you know, that was a real issue. I think the sort of basic question was that the, the necessary measures to stop the pandemic, which was really required and that scientists said were required, the shutdown of non-essential production in particular, the closure yeah. of schools, and then with that, the provision of resources to workers affected yes. so that they could get through it while these measures were in place, Full that light. was... Yeah. Uh, that undermined it and was against the interests of the financial oligarchy. They could not tolerate it. And uh, they used the pandemic to hand out trillions of dollars to themselves in the so-called CARES Act. Far more money was turned over to the markets uh, in Mar beginning in March of last year than even after the 2008 financial crash. Also, four also, trillion dollars. Also, and then they began the back to work campaign. Uh, just one last point, because we're talking yes. about auto workers in India walking off the job, which they have been are trying to stop production uh, in Chennai, U.S. auto workers did the same thing in March. There are wildcat strikes against, not, not run by the UAW. The workers themselves took action to stop production as the pandemic was initially spreading. The UAW intervened with the auto companies in order to get the workers back to work uh, by the next month, by April and into May. And all the auto companies were then back in production uh, and that kind of collaboration is just, in my opinion, that's 
that's well the interest of you never trust those people again the interest you look at what are the unions because they always talk oh the unions the unions these are workers organized what are these organizations manage for that you have to look at the money you know these are organizations run by executives that make 200 300 400 500 thousand dollars or more a year even they have assets in the millions or hundreds of millions of dollars massive strike funds that are never utilized they are heavily invested in wall street have, have, the interests of these people are connected to the interests of the markets have, and therefore we're bound up with forcing workers back to work so that the markets didn't collapse have either of you ever lived in the south no, i have I, I, I have not so i lived on the tennessee virginia border for a little while so when i read an article that says union not even national regional union executives in alabama with the umwa are making a hundred thousand dollars a year a hundred twenty five thousand dollars a year one hundred seventy five thousand dollars a year i'm going by the numbers that were quoted in in a specific article when they're making that much i understand how much money that is in alabama because of the places that i've lived so when we're talking about one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in Alabama, that is not the same as a hundred thousand dollars in Detroit or New York City. It doesn't count all the money they're skimming off from the dues money, as we see. Yeah, well, well, no, but but even like, just that, even dollars. just their basic salary, yeah. is a massive well, amount of money. It puts them in, in the Alabama. upper upper middle class. You know, the top, even the top five percent. Are you talking about someone like Randy Weingarten, the head of the teachers' union? Who's forcing the teachers to, to work? She makes more than half a million a year, you know, and she's on the Democratic National Committee. You know, this is the state. It's you know, th this is what these. The, the, uh, anyway, Eric is wanting to speak. I'll, <laughs> I'll uh, stop. I, well, I, I'm always wanting to speak, but no, I mean the point. The point that I think is really critical is that um, the DSA is attacking our movement specifically because we expose the bureaucracies uh, of the AFL-CIO. So, and this is, it's actually interesting if you go back and you look at what initially prompted them to start posting photos of ice picks, the weapon used to murder Trotsky. Um, the, uh, this all begins over the fact that our articles, the World Socialist website articles, Quoting workers who are on strike, quoting workers at Volvo, quoting workers at Warrior Met all over the world, um, in which workers say, in their words, that the trade union is forcing us to work during COVID. They're forcing us to accept sellout contracts. They're in bed with the company. That it's in response to writing what the workers are saying that the DSA responds with threats, basically, <laughs> you know, that murdering Trotskyists is justifiable. And um, then you have this incident. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, because I just yeah, we can go to Brock Brookwood, which I think is very elucidating of this process. But the point is more to show what the DSA is. Um, and yes, as you, Chris, I just want to respond to this because you mentioned earlier. There's this. There's this thing that the DSA. They all say that uh, the World Socialist website, you know, is an anti-union organization. They're they they, you know, they just hate the unions. I mean, the first biggest. of all. The biggest and worst lie that I have heard, because I know this isn't true, I've, I've spoken to Joseph quite a bit, they, they support right to work laws. Yeah, I mean, it, it, whatever, they can say whatever they want. But point, point is, um, the World Socialist website's position is that workers, whether they're in a union or not, should form committees that they themselves control in which the leaders are subject to immediate recall Nobody gets a wage higher than the wage of an average worker. And committees which are democratically run to connect workers at different plants with workers in other industries and workers internationally. Now, none of the DSA members have been able to give a single reason why that proposal is wrong. You know, I mean, we're, we have rank and file committees of you know, Volvo workers. We're not, those workers it's, it's, are in the UAW. They're not saying decertify from the UAW. They're just saying we need our own organization. Because they're very, they're very empty. Remember what I said about they've been in a defensive posture since Joe Biden 
was nominated, despite the fact, despite the fact that Joe Biden's nomination was all but inevitable, like I said before, I mean, there's always, you know, the one out of a hundred chance that an opportunist pulls something off because this is one of the few times that something democratic actually happens. But that doesn't happen very often. And when it does, there's usually a way that it's smothered or used to capitalism's advantage and used to prolong and protect capitalism rather than to take the next step and proceed to dismantle it and do something better. Um, but because, because that's not happening, they, there's this whole mindset there. They're not in a working class mindset. They do not want to pose a threat to the political establishment. They believe that they can influence the elites to cooperate with them to achieve specific reforms in the name of protecting capitalism that will then allow them to make another set of reforms, supposedly. Well, but, look, just to add to that point real quick before we move on, I mean, I would say the mindset comes from their class position. Yes. The BSA is an upper middle class organization. Its members They're, and leaders- They are elite they, in, in the frame that I use. Where we have where we have a system where there's landlords, bosses, and everybody else, uh, the majority of people associated with DSA are what I would call the boss class. They're the suits. They're the the guy in the office at the boutique activist NGO. They're the guy in the office at the the union the union hall. They're, they're, they're active in the Democratic Party. I mean, they're active in the Democratic Party, or they are active in various local operations that do a lot of good on a community level, but channel political energy into failed candidates from the establishment on a state or national level. And they did not have a plan for what happens if Bernie loses. So it's really important to remember that if an organization doesn't have a plan for what happens if they lose a fixed primary being run by an organization that has that made the argument in court in California that they have the right to fix their, their primaries because there's no such thing as a Democrat unless you are a dues-paying member of a Democratic Party club. It was, it's, so they're basically a private corporation. You're not a Democrat just because you're registered as a Democrat or vote for Democratic candidates loyally, or even campaign and organize for Democratic candidates lo loyally. You're only a Democrat if you are a dues-paying member of a Democratic Party club. And that is your ticket into the political establishment, which means that no matter how well-meaning and no matter how radical you are, you have to be the sort of person who can afford to pay the dues and afford to put in the time glad-handed. Well, you know, I think, it, I mean, what is the DSA? The DSA, and of course, you know, there are, there are young people well, and let's let's go back to the okay. early history because eric mentioned shockmanites and that's a good place to go when you ask what's dsa dsa is the successor to a sh to the death knell of the original american socialist party uh during the cold war where they just where they were where their ranks had become so small that they were taken over by the Shachmanites, who were refugees from the Socialist Workers Party, uh, who let who had left earlier, who had been bounced around in around the fringes of left politics ever since, and made a conscious decision to stop trying to organize the working class 
and to instead harness themselves to bourgeois politicians and bourgeois parties. Well, Harrington, you know, you described the the DSA as the what you call the left wing of the possible, that is the yes. left wing of the establishment bourgeois politics. I mean, if we're talking about all right, what is the DSA? It's history. It emerges that you said Shackman who split from the Trotskyist movement in 1939-1940 uh, yeah. uh, on the basis of an adaptation, in its essence, to American imperialism, and uh, anti-communism, moves, moves is, further and further to the right in the course of yeah. the 1940s, the 1950s, uh, then brought his, and Harrington, who was a close associate of, of Shackman in the 1960s, yes. brought it into the Socialist Party. Uh, and um, on the basis of ever more open support for war, and Shackman himself was a supporter of the Korean War, and then a supporter, in fact, of the Vietnam War. And the Bay of Pigs invasion. Well, invasion. Shackman had a, I believe, an accurate conception of the bureaucratic ruling class of the USSR, but he then also had a failed, a failed image of the American state as somehow anti-fascist and pro-democratic in a way that allowed it to be influenced. And that wasn't an accurate view of the American experiment, especially not the American political system that was developing as being strictly Democrats and Republicans in an increasingly stratified and dominating position to the point where, you know, after the war, they would go on to take over the actual election machinery of the country that's now controlled by political parties and not by the government. Well, Shackman aligned himself with the conservative pro-capitalist and pro-imperialist trade union bureaucracy. People that he himself had condemned in his publication during the Great Depression, I will add. Yeah, yeah, and during that, and you know, Ruther and others, you know, who were at that point associated, or you know, they were involved in organizations that you know were uh, at that time could still be called working class organizations. Although in 1955, the AFL and the CIO merged on the basis of a pro-capitalist uh, uh, orientation and, and support for the Democratic Party and pro-imperialist. One, one of the great tragedies, because the CIO was so important in moving workers left of that. It had been know, formed, the great yeah. industrial unions by socialists and insurrectionary yeah. struggles, including the, you know, the sit-down strikes, which helped form the in, uh, United including Auto the including the period uh, the period when the the United Mine Workers of America were actually doing good things for miners on some level. Yeah, um, you know these were these were organizations which were had been built through which, bitter bitter struggles. Fun fact: Cecil Roberts is Ma Blizzard's great grandson. Oh yeah, and Ma Blizzard was the the partner in crime, literally, under the laws of the day of Mother Jones. Um, so he is he is labor aristocracy. He is the great-grandson of a UMWA icon. Well, you know what's funny? That's that's too bad. It's a disservice to his family history. Yes. Just one, one, thing, yes. one thing which just picking up on what Joe said. I mean, the DSA, from its founding in the Demo and the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, was explicitly founded as a part of the Democratic Party. And its orientation within the Democratic Party was throughout the Carter administration, throughout the, you know, the Tip O'Neill reign of the Democratic, conservative Democratic Party in the 1980s, throughout the 90s, through the Congressional Progressive Caucus. So the DSAs had 50 years to try and push the Democrats to the left from within. And over they've that, been over right that period, instead. the Democratic Party has gone further and further to the right, to the point where Joe Biden now is is that the DSA is in the absurd position of trying to be a, dem a socialist organization, which has got five members in the Democratic Caucus in Congress and supporting Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi. So just because I think there is an in important and interesting, and by the way, I would say you know for for the old guard of the DSA, and, and maybe some of them are listening or, or will be following this, but people like Bill Barclay, 
Jack Clark, Richard Healy, Deborah Meyer, Maxine Phillips, Joseph M. Schwartz, Barbara Ehrenreich. These people know that the origins of the DSA were based on supposed democratic opposition to Stalinism. That was their whole raison d'etre. That was the whole purpose of their project. Now, yes, it was. as we've explained, it had its origins yeah. in anti-communism yeah. and an orientation to U.S. The, 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 the issue is that today, this is full circle. Now, the DSA, and these old guard know this, and they're concerned about this. They've lost control of their organization to a bunch of people who are just spouting the lies of Stalin and, and justifying the worst crimes of the Stalinist bureaucracy. Now, when Maria Svart remains silent and the entire leadership of the DSA, including those people I just mentioned, remain silent, they are accepting uh, because we've offered them an opportunity to respond and to condemn this. I mean, but by them to do so, they, they, are they are accepting and justifying and legitimizing all of the crimes of Stalinism, which they at one point purported to oppose. And I think that that's a very significant um, full circle. And it, it really explodes the whole reason for having the DSA in the first place. Yeah, but that's the politics of the Democratic Party. Yeah. And I think, you know, th this is what they are sort of channeling. I mean, just to give, this is the first, the first issue of Democratic Left produced by the DSA. You can find this in their archives. You can go back and you can get all the PDFs. The first issue edited by Michael Harrington with the editorial written by Michael Harrington in which he says that the aim in the presidential election is to build a progressive majority for the Democratic Party in 1974 and 1976 as a first step toward the transformation of the nation. And then he concludes, we do not want to purge the new politics from the Democratic Party. We choose rather to help bring out its best potential. And it, the DSA has been bringing out the best potential of the Democratic the Party the for the past half century. And yeah. the Democratic Party has moved further and further to the right. I mean, and and they've dragged DSA with them. Because and they've dragged you, DSA with them. And, that's you, the, and now it's reached the point where they're, you know, the DSA is, you know, spouting you know, Stalinist, you know, you know, violent memes against Trotskyism. And, uh, and opposition to authoritarian leadership in general, which I can't stress enough, because in addition to the specific threat against Trotskyists and against SEP and Socialist Alternative, because quite a few of the people that Eric mentioned are people who were co-authors of an article in In These Times called The Dangers of Factionalism in DSA, which was in response to Kashama Savant's decision to join DSA and to ask members of her party, Socialist Alternative, which is by their, by their testimony, a Trotskyist organization. That's how they identify themselves. Uh, the, basically, they were saying, we don't want them. Don't let them join. These people are dangerous. They're going to wreck us. And the term wreckers was prominently used in the, the implied threat against the Socialist Equality Party as well. There is a broad fear of the Trotskyist movement, as Joseph and Eric have both mentioned, and also of any opposition, because they are also deliberately smearing people who are not Trotskyists, in some cases, not necessarily seriously radical socialists, people who are still centered themselves in many ways around bourgeois electoral politics, but people like Jimmy Dore and Ryan Knight uh, and and Brianna Joy Brianna Joy Gray, who are on the well to the electoral left of DSA, if not necessarily radical and revolutionary yet. And those people are being attacked with the same vigor and venom as as Trotskyists. It's this there's this broad attempt to suppress all opposition to established position within the broader left. That's why I think, you know, taking taking the DSA's arguments at their best. And that's, I think, the, the challenge of polemicizing. 
But the GSA claims that they have this inside outside approach, right? They say, yes. well, we we do all our work within the Democratic Party, but we also do work outside the Democratic Party. And what this 50 year history of that has proven is that not only does it move, give the Democratic Party a left cover for its rightward march and its imperialist war, the destruction of Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, but it also wastes the energy and disorients the people who are ostensibly think they're doing work outside the Democratic Party. So the Socialist Equality Party takes an outside outside approach to the Democratic Party and to imperialist politics. I would just say on the issue of socialist alternatives, since you mentioned it, first of all, the position of the Socialist Equality Party has been, we defend Shama Sawant against the threats from fascists within the city government. We defended her. She's come under threats. The, there is an obligation that the city has to protect her, to protect her family and her staff. Um, we have defended her and we will continue to do so despite our political disagreements. Same with Al Ocasio-Cortez. She was uh, almost killed on January 6th yeah. uh, by a fascist mob which attempted to uh, implement a coup d'etat and, and overturn the results of the 2020 elections. We defended her despite our differences. Now, the DSA and Socialist Alternative, we should add, have remained completely silent about the, um, the attacks, uh, the promotion of Stalin's, Stalinist lies against Trotsky. Um, and it's worth mentioning that this, that Socialist Alternative is an organization which claims to be Trotskyist. So either they have to issue a very strong statement opposing the DSA leadership's campaign, or they just simply forfeit any, I mean, we don't believe that their politics are Trotskyist right now, but if they remain silent, they're just simply forfeiting um, any right to reference Trotskyism in the future. Yeah, they're basically saying we this doesn't bother us, and it, and that's that's not a good sign. I, I agree. I would also say, more importantly, that the broader defense of fellow of course. Fellow outsiders, because regardless of regardless of our discomfort with her ties to the establishment, is it is important to understand that that uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez is someone threatened by the the right wing of the political establishment on a regular basis, and is someone who deserves personal defense in situations where she is being threatened by, you know, fascists and right wingers and and those who want to quash dissent. And at the same time, it's important to push back when she tries to pull us into the establishment. I think though that it's very important to defend people we disagree with on principle. Joseph and I do not agree on everything. We have had arguments uh, about how important white supremacy is in an analysis of American capitalism. And that's a fair argument to have. But I defend the, the SEP and I platform the SEP because I believe that the popular front strategy has failed, that we need some sort of united front if we are going to have any chance of winning and the only way to get close to that is for us to all talk to each other and all defend each other and all have the arguments we disagree about in an open and democratic way. Well, all our opponents call us sectarian, and yet here we are willing to do the same and to defend the rights, the democratic rights of groups that we oppose including when they're censored by Google, censored by Twitter and Facebook. We defend them. We defend the rights yes. of USA podcasters. Maybe, Joe, you want to, you could get into this. But when, this is very good. That's DSA, actually very good to talk DSA, about. Uh, yeah, when two DSA podcasters were uh, assaulted, violently assaulted by two leaders of the United Mine Workers uh, of America in Brookwood, Alabama last month, we defended their right to... We don't agree with what they're saying, but we, of course, defend their democratic right to say it. Um, so, yes, I mean, we believe that this, this sort of slander that all, all the Socialist Equality Party is is a sectarian organization completely uh, ignores the fact that here we are willing to, willing to work with people to expose 
the promotion of Stalinist lies and threats of assassination by the Democratic Party. And uh, we get crickets from socialist alternative, crickets from the DSA leadership. But we do get a lot of support from within the DSA, I will say that. And we'll get support from, from the workers. Working uh, you know, I, I think it's important to understand that you know, the, the, there's been attacks which are directed at us. The UMWA, you know, the, the and these were, you know, the way it was presented and sort of on Twitter by the people, the podcasters involved was that it was some miners who were involved in an attack on the podcast. Which it was, was not false. some miners. It was the president of the uh, UMWA District 20, uh, Vice President Larry Spencer, and and, a, and uh, another representative of the UMWA District 20, James Blankenship, both of whom are on the executive board of the AFL-CIO in Alabama. And as of, is the writer of that article, if you if if, if you check, he is their Morris, political Morris. associate on that board. Yeah. Well, so this, but it was directed, and, and you know there was this yeah. attack, and we defended the the, the DSA members. Yes. Who were, subject to the attack and denounced it. It was directed at the World Socialist website because the, the yes. UMWA is terrified of the uh, growth of opposition among minors. But I think the important point to understand in all of this is that the fundamental target is the working class. And if and the, the UMWA, what they are terrified of is the growth of opposition among their, their, their so-called own members. That is the workers that they claim to represent. Uh, and they, they, what they are very, very fearful of is that the opposition among the workers will take a organized and conscious form. And that's why there's this, you know, the, the hysterical opposition to the development of rank and file committees, independent organizations of working class struggle through which the workers can, in fact, uh, fight for their interests, can, can, can organize and unite uh, and develop a coordinated struggle, not only in the United States, but all over the world. And they're terrified of that. They have created a social powder peg, the ruling class, to put it in somewhat of a broader framework. Again, I mean, the, the response to the pandemic, decades of growing social inequality, of, of relentless assault on the working class, in which the unions have worked to suppress opposition, uh, the incredible concentration of wealth in the hands of the oligarchy, then the pandemic, which has killed over 600,000 people, in fact, more like a million in the US, 3.5 million around the world. The, the billionaire, the oligarchy has used it to amass unprecedented levels of wealth. They're carrying out austerity measures demanding that workers pay for it. Uh, this is producing a social explosion. And you know what they're really terrified of is that. Uh, but we are oriented towards building a movement there's, in the working class. There's, that's what they don't want, an independent movement to break the working class from the Democratic Party.